glasses. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming out for on this very steamy night for what will be a very hot topic, right? <laughs> I love that. Absolutely. If we could please find our seats and, and come towards the front, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much all for joining us. Welcome to GBH and Get Connected, um, our Affirmative Action Town Hall, live from GBH Studios and also from the GBH YouTube channel. I'm Liz Chang, General Manager of our six broadcast channels, as well as World, which is, uh, features multicultural filmmakers focused on their diverse communities. And as you all know and can tell, I'm standing next to a force of nature. <laughs> thank you, Liz. And thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Colette Phillips, President, Founder of Get Connected, after the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling restricting race-conscious admission in higher education, today's rising seniors of color are confused, they're panicked, since college applications for some must be finalized in about a month. Their parents, college counselors, high schools, and college universities are joining in the scrabble to figure out how things must change. Our first panel will discuss what can we collectively as a community do to help today? And in the coming years, what efforts must be taken to address this decision? Thank you, Colette. And our second panel asks not if but when a case arises and the Supreme Court turns its attention to affirmative action in the workplace. Yes, it's coming. Uh, will companies and employees be ready? Our two insightful panels are relying on your questions here in the GBH studio, as well as those watching on YouTube to make this discussion even better. Tonight, sadly, we are offering our condolences to Dr. Keith and Angela Motley, who have been tireless advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion in Boston and beyond. Their daughter, Kayla, passed away unexpectedly last night, and they're in our thoughts tonight. May we just take a few moments of silence to honor Kayla. This event is presented by Get Connected, GBH, World, with special thanks to our partners, the Boston Foundation, Amplify Latinx, National Association of Asian American Professionals, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, the Partnership, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, Boston, and Commonwealth Seminar and the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts. First up, a look at our rising high school seniors in this world, in this colorblind world. For six decades, affirmative action has played an essential role in diversifying student classes in higher education. While the headlines claim the United States Supreme Court recently ended affirmative action for college admissions, the reality is colleges can still consider race for an individual applicant, but cannot use percentages or set quotas to arrive at a predetermined result. Confusing? You bet. The complexity of this decision has caused deep concern among students of color, their parents, high school advisors, and higher education professionals. Most colleges really care about student body diversity because they see the, imp the positive impact that it has on their campus, and it kind of aligns with their goals as an institution. So they're thinking about how do we maintain that? While it would have been clearer to uphold or completely strike down any consideration of race in college admissions, 
This decision is causing a complete rethink of the college application process. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote in part of his opinion that it was time to see, quote, the university's admissions policies for what they are, rudderless race-based preferences. Those policies fly in the face of our colorblind constitution. Professor Natasha Warwicku of Tufts University thinks we're far from a colorblind society, especially on college campuses. We may not want race to play a role in our society, um, but unfortunately, it is clear that it does. This ruling joins eight states with banned affirmative action policies, including neighboring New Hampshire, which voted to ban in 2011, and California, the first state to ban in 1996. Despite spending half a billion dollars uh, since then on programs like recruitment, um, uh, access and opportunity programs, um, and financial aid, they have not been able to get back to the pre-ban levels of Black and Latino enrollment. Prior to the ban, 20% of students enrolling at University of California schools were from minority or underrepresented communities. In 1997, the number dipped to 15 percent and continued to decline to about 5 percent of African-American students. Students were not even applying and fewer were getting in. In contrast, in 1963, Harvard University enrolled just 1 percent of African-American students. And in 2021, the enrollment was just 9.4 percent. Even though the percentage of students who are Black and Latino are smaller than the overall percentage in the United States. Um, some of those students, of course, were um, uh, benefited from race conscious admissions, and that's no longer going to be uh, per legally permissible. Which makes administrators like J. Malcolm Cawthorn, METCO director for Brookline Public Schools, unsure of the future of their rising seniors. Now, we're still going to encourage our kids to apply. We're not. We're not going to stop them from that. We. Um, I think, you know, part of our policy is to make those schools say no, as opposed to us declaring no before we even apply. Cawthorn knows all too well that some of the students who rely on him for mentorship and guidance will be left hanging in the balance. We're going to continue to encourage our kids to put faith in the work that they've done. We have a college counselor who works directly with our METCO students uh, um, who, you know, is, is on the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff, but, you know, we want to make sure our kids, while they know what they're walking into and know that this decision has impact, that that doesn't deny the four years or, you know, three and starting a fourth year of hard work, and it doesn't deny their merit. Harvard University, a defendant in this ruling, remains committed to a campus that reflects experiences from all backgrounds. President-elect Claudine Gay, its first African-American president, adds that while complying with the court's decision will necessitate changes to the way the university pursues diversity, Harvard's commitment to that work, quote, remains steadfast. I want to thank everyone for joining us here this evening. Give yourselves a round of applause for being in the audience and coming out in this hot and hazy weather especially. And of course, thank you to all of our panelists uh, for being with us this evening as well. So let's jump right in here. Chip, I'm going to start with you, especially because I forgot to do it. It's okay. <laughs> I thought I so, down. but I was like, I don't know what I, I did. It. I'm like, oh, we're done. So I went to sit down, so I, I apologize so for that. And of course, everyone knows our moderator, the fabulous Paris <laughs> Alston, a co host for GBH 89.7 Morning Edition and the Wake Up podcast on GBH News, and also our host for the State of Race. So yay, Paris. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And we have a distinguished panel today uh, that uh, who's joining us. And, and, and frankly, all each and every one of them have achieved many first ever milestones in their respective careers. First up, Patrick Tutwiler is Massachusetts Secretary of Education, who oversees early education, K-12, and higher education for the Bay State. Julie Chen is the Chancellor of UMass Lowell and a recognized leader in research, STEM, and economic development in higher education. George Chip Greenwich, Jr. is a founder and director of The Greatest Minds, a BIPOC-run nonprofit that mentors young people as they pursue college, career, and good citizenship. Many of his students are here today wearing The Greatest Minds t-shirts, so yay. <laughs> Paris, all yours. All righty. Thank you so much, Liz. Also, a round of applause to Liz and Colette, both wonderful, wonderful people here. 
Um, so Chip, I, I do want to give a shout out to Greatest Minds. You have a number of students in the audience here wearing their Greatest Minds. 40, 40. 40 students with their Greatest Minds t-shirts on. Awesome. One, and, two. And we know that uh, the, this is the population, right, uh, at least part of the population that is waiting in the wings now and wondering where to go from here. So what have you been hearing from students and parents uh, in the wake and educators in the wake of the ruling? You know, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. I've been waiting for a groundswell of all of us to get together. And I just want to thank the leadership of the organizations that are presented here to start having this discussion and ways that we as a community can come together and start figuring out strategies, how we can challenge this and continue to challenge this, but also have a groundswell where we can back up our young people out there to make sure that they're going forward. Um, one thing I got to say is that I think our young people are resilient. And I think they're very, very smart. They just manage COVID and all these different things. And they've learned so much about themselves. And so in order for us to be able to handle that is that we're going to have to start relying on all the organizations that we just saw up on there, along with the greatest minds and all of them, to start being these backbones for these organizations. Think about it. I grew up in, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. There was no Nesby at that time in the 70s. You know, they started in the 70s. Um, Association of Black Accountants and all these things. All these organizations came about. Association of Black Foundation Executives. All these uh, organizations came about to be the next generation to go out there and support young people and support the careers. So now we need all these organizations that weren't in existence at this time to come back out here and also to take hands with our young people and be in front of them and be role models to surround them and make sure they get the hookup and the, and the support to mm -hmm. go forward. Mm -hmm. And we all want the hookup now, okay? <laughs> So, <laughs> Secretary Tutliler, uh, the Supreme Court has th 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 not completely thrown out affirmative action, but did narrow its use pretty greatly. And so, what advice are you giving to students and parents and educators? Uh, I think that the uh, Brookline MECO director said it best. Mm -hmm. You are brilliant. You are prepared. You are ready. Still apply and make them say no to you. Mm -hmm. That would be the message that I would communicate very adamantly as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is there anything that the state is doing actively uh, to advise colleges and universities about how to navigate this new minefield, really? Yep, indeed. Uh, so a few things. First, uh, Borrowing from our understanding of the states that had already gone in this direction prior to the Supreme Court decision, uh, we know that there's a chill that happens in communities of color when decisions like that mm -hmm. happen. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we communicated first and foremost. Uh, the governor released a message prior to the decision making clear that the core values of this administration are one around representation in higher education, and regardless of the decision, our core values will, will remain and we will work within the scope of the law to ensure that there's representation in our institutions of higher learning. One, two, get ready. Uh, and we <laughs> did so by establishing or assembling an advisory uh, for the representation in higher education in Massachusetts. I see some members of that advisory here, but this is exactly what my guy Chip uh, said we need. It's a, a, a an assembly of NAACP, Urban League, some of the greatest thinkers and, and workers, there are students involved, there's the, the colleges and universities in the state of uh, Massachusetts are involved. Uh, we met before the decision, we met on the day of the decision to sort of uh, take a moment and, and understand the weight of this and then we meet next week for the first time formally to begin strategizing exactly in the way that my guy said that we should. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we know that September is right around the corner, right? Which is when the application process really begins to ramp up. Um, and Chancellor Chen, uh, we talked a little bit about this on Morning Edition today. Thanks again for joining us there and here. Um, tell me a little bit about how UMass Lowell responded to this right in the immediate aftermath uh, and, and how you all are preparing as the fall approaches. Yeah, thank you, Paris. It, it, we responded, I think, like so many higher ed institutions, as, as Pat said, to reiterate that, yes, we have to follow the law, but we are committed to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at our university. And we're proud of the fact that we're over 43% students of color at the university. But, but we recognize, and I think the point you made, 
the concern is that chilling. We do not want the message to be that you shouldn't apply. In fact, we want to redouble our efforts to say you should apply. College is for you. It's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of understanding um, those opportunities that college brings. And so we want to keep getting that message out that this does not mean you should apply. You should definitely apply and talk to us about who you are as a holistic person. Mm -hmm. And Chip, to the extent that you're able, take us inside some of these greatest minds, right? I mean, when you hear a ruling like the one that came down last month, what does that do to, to a, a child's spirit, right? I mean, these are still children we're talking about, but obviously emerging young adults. Um, but students who, who, to Chancellor Chen's point, may be thinking, well, uh, does this mean that I, I, this may not be for me after all? Well, one thing I want people to do, and I think the students are doing this as well, is you got to talk to your grandmother, your great aunts, your, gra uh, your cousins, and your, all these family members and neighbors, because they have those whispers of those stories when they were denied and still being denied of many things. I remember uh, Charles Ogletree, maybe 15 years ago, I brought a group of students. He had Mary McLeod, no, excuse me, um, 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 Dorothy Height, excuse me, he had Dorothy Height at his um, school, and we had students actually come um, to visit. And she talked about her experience of applying to Barnard College, and she showed up, remember her last name, you know, um, uh, Dorothy Height, um, and she thought what actually happened was they said when they saw her as a black woman coming to the door, they told her, uh-oh, we already had our one quota of mm -hmm. a black. And so they told her that she had to go home. You know what I mean? So it's interesting enough that she was able to go to another school, but she was able to have that story and pass it on to let people know that, that she wanted to go to that college and be there. Mm -hmm. So the thing that our young people got to know is that you deserve to apply, you should apply, but also you have your checklist. You make sure that college and university is for you. Make sure that it has the background and the things and supports that make sure that you can be a successful student, okay? Some colleges and universities, um, that you hear the name, but you got to check it out. You got to lift up that hood like you do a car and see if the engine's running. You got to lift up and look at the back and see how much gas and mileage is on that because that's your money that's putting into that um, education system. And you're going to make sure that car has to go for your whole career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. So, Secretary, yeah, yeah, clap. <laughs> hey, that student Amen. gets a raise, that clap. <laughs> hey, you don't have to come to work tomorrow. <laughs> So, Secretary Tutwiler, I know you mentioned some of the things that the state is already doing um, to help everyone be prepared for this and for this new landscape. Uh, but is there sort of a definitive how-to guide anywhere? Is, is there a discussion about implementing that? No. Should there be one? Uh, we're creating one. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the, the video lifted up the fact that uh, the experience of the states who have gone this direction prior to the uh, Supreme Court decision, have not been successful in mm -hmm. increasing the enrollment of uh, students from historically marginalized uh, backgrounds. And so uh, we're, we're building anew, and there's a few things that we're doing right out of the gate. One uh, is expanding the MyCap program, which stands for My Career and Academic uh, Plan. It is an online program that exists right now in 230 high schools across Massachusetts. We're working to expand that. It's a very helpful, to, I had it in Lynn when I was superintendent. It's a very helpful program for helping students understand the trajectory of the college planning process, um, number one. Number two, we are expanding and we'll be doing a targeted um, advertising cam or marketing campaign for MIFA online resources, which mm -hmm. are free uh, to all students and families. Same sort of idea of helping students and families navigate uh, the trajectory of the college process. And then there's things that are already in place in Massachusetts that we're going to build on that have shown incredibly strong returns. For example, early college, mm -hmm. which I'm a big proponent of. Mm -hmm. uh, that and this is also something that the governor has been pushing uh, investment in as well. Uh, she has indeed. She, uh, in her first budget, uh, increased uh, early college programs by $14 million, now putting it at uh, just shy of $47 million in her first uh, budget. And that program again, has shown incredible returns. 77% uh, of the students who have an early college experience actually matriculate to, to college uh, compared to 55% of their peers. Uh, we're also seeing early returns in terms of their persistence while in college. It's a relatively new program in Massachusetts. It's only 
five or six years mm -hmm. old. Uh, but we believe this is something we have to double down on in light of this decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, are any of our students here, do you take early college courses? Are you involved in any of those? And have they have they helped you? Are they, are they interesting? Not boring? Okay, cool. Good to know. And there's there's also like AP and, oh, go ahead, Chancellor. Yeah, ma'am, I can just add to that because I do want to thank the state for their support because we have an early college program where we have UMass Lowell faculty teaching with the high school teachers in the classroom and it's two things, right? It's the student understanding this is a college course that they are successful at, and to your point on the career part, it starts to open up that idea of, oh, what careers are there that I could participate that make me go, this is why I wanna go to college because I wanna go down this pathway. I just wanna jump in real quick is that we're here in Boston, we are a college rich town. Mm -hmm. I've been able, as someone born and raised here and many generations here, I've been able to walk on Harvard University's campus and actually meet Cornell West, and I had a student with me. Did he I dance said, for you? He you know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> but you know, there are many programs. Like I was a part of a Mass Pep, which was a pre-engineering program. Colette remembers this. Is that um, it was a pre-engineering program at Northeastern and BU for the summertime, where I would work with students together in a group to learn about math and science. And you know what? It taught me to stay up late. It taught me to work hard to get the answer. Mm -hmm. And so we're lucky here. Now we also got to think about our other places as well, such as Georgia, such as Texas, mm. such as Florida, that don't have the same kind of robust system. So yes, we can be slapping five here, but we have a lot of resources in this up here, but we also got to look about our brothers and sisters all around this country mm -hmm. and what role can we play as well. And I'm glad you... I'm glad you mentioned that, Chip, because I, I grew up a little further north, right? But not not quite up here in North Carolina, right? So not like deep south, uh, not like, you know, like Abbott and DeSantis south, but <laughs> but there was enough going on. But I uh, I had, you know, the, the great privilege of, of having two parents who had gone and graduated to college, having an older sibling who did the same as well. Um, and also benefiting from a program at UNC Chapel Hill, which ironically is named in this in this whole case, right? Um, but it was a journalism program, a week-long camp that I went to and affirmed that that's what I wanted to do, and I ended up going to school there and graduating, right? And that's what we want. And it was also specifically a diversity in media program. So those are the things that we want to see, right? Um, but Chancellor Chen, I'm wondering, one, you know, what is UMass Lowell doing to reach back into that pipeline? What are some of the programs that UMass Lowell has to establish that for students here in Massachusetts or elsewhere across the country? And also, with this ruling, I mean, do you, do you worry that there's a threat to programs like that as well? Yeah, so, uh, certainly. So we have programs, as you mentioned, with the early college program. We have a lot of summer, summer camp programs, again, that like the one you went to, that brings high school students and middle school students to the campus so they can see themselves, right? This is what a campus feels like. They can meet students, they can meet uh, faculty. And so those are great opportunities to, to get a sense of I belong here. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is a concern. This ruling, we, we do worry about what the next step is. And will they start to say, okay, you can't ask that uh, information when you're deciding who to admit to these various programs because they are limited, right? We can't take everybody and so it's a matter of making sure that we understand um, holistically who would benefit the most from these programs. And so we have to rethink a little bit about how to get that information about who will benefit from these programs with our goal of diversifying the whole pipeline and, and basically success in this world. Mm -hmm. So Secretary Tutwiler, Tyler, Tutwiler, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> I can't be up here calling you, you Pat. Can say <laughs> You uh, alluded earlier to, to other decisions in other states and how the long-term impacts of those. Um, when you think about that, especially when you think about what happened in California, um, what challenges do you foresee for Massachusetts, right? I mean, like, I think we, we tend to think so often, right, we're this liberal bubble. We, we even saw with um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right? Like, okay, we, we are pretty much protected now, but down the line for other people who are trying to come here and take advantage of some of the services um, and, and privileges that we have in the state in that regard, those things may be threatened too. Are those concerns present for you here as well? Um, yes, mm -hmm. I, you know, to, to be very candid with you. And, 
you know, we've researched pretty, pretty deeply the experience in the other states. We saw, or those states saw an immediate decline in the enrollment of students of color immediately after the decision. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there, there's a couple of different ways that an individual can respond to that. They can be worried and concerned, or they can see, use that as an impetus to work even harder to ensure that that doesn't happen here. And that's really the tack that we're taking by the things that we've done thus far and, that, and by the things we intend to do in the short term. Mm -hmm. So I do want to throw um, an audience question that we got uh, from Angela Van, Van, Vela, excuse me, I am not getting anybody's name right today, Valenzuela from Austin, Texas, speaking of Texas, who asks, are race neutral percent plans for admissions in higher education a viable option in light of the SCOTUS decision? Uh, Chancellor Chen, would you like to put that on? Yeah, so what, what we're seeing is uh, it, where the information on the application in the past would have been known, right, by the, by the person reviewing the application. We're seeing that because of the ruling, the uh, folks reading the applications won't know that information, which is why we think it is important uh, as students fill out those applications that they tell more in the essay about who they are, what have they experienced, what's their mm -hmm. background been, how did they get to where they are? Because ultimately, that gives information beyond just a box on the application, which will help us to understand how do we create an environment that is rich, an environment where the student next to you is somebody who's going to have a different background that you can learn from. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was at UNC, I, one of the things I did while I was there, I volunteered as a writing coach for one of the local high schools. And one of the things that I was tasked with was helping students like you, high school seniors, with their college essays. And a trap that I think, I mean, I hate to call it a trap because it wasn't their fault, was always having to write, write about their trauma, about all of these hardships in their life, about um, you know, these things that they, they experienced that kind of was right, like, woe is me, let me into this university, right? Chip, how do, how do you strike the balance, right, by, by wanting to share that experience, but also wanting to bring your full self and being able to write about like, you know, things that you're interested in on a higher level and about space or like in the environment or whatever it may be. A hundred percent, I think you're nailing this right on the head, is that um, as I speak to these young people all throughout the summer, network, network, network. You see these two people up here? If you don't leave with their business cards, as you guys know, <laughs> you know, you have done the wrong thing today. And that's what it is, it's about networking and having these rich experiences. Um, going out and um, being able to shadow someone like Pratt, you know what I mean, for a whole day or maybe a whole week, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but shadowing individuals and being able to see their career, college to career pipeline that they can actually be, those are the things that you can write about. Um, students right here, they wrote editorials to the Globe this week, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They put, uh, they put over uh, 40 um, applications into the Globe to be student ed editors. Those are the things you write about. You know what I mean? Going to the NAACP convention next week mm -hmm. that they're all going to. Those are the things and stories that you should talk about. But also, you also must, there's so, these college admissions people, they get so many essays, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Martin Luther King, they get a lot of those, mm -hmm. and all these other things that people, but talk about the things that make you smile, but also talk about the things that you want to change in this world. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I think makes people stand out and um, be able to um, go forward and be able to tackle the things that they want to do. Yeah. I, I would second that. It, it's, it's about that essay expressing who you are, right? Why you've thought about, why am I going to college? What is it that I want to do? What, is I, what have I experienced? And how, what do you take away from that experience? That tells something about who you are. And I think that what you want that to come through in an authentic way so that you don't just look like a cookie cutter application that's mm. the same as everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And Secretary Tutwiler, is that something that we could start to see in high school curriculums, for instance, um, as, as time goes on? Uh, more of a push to broaden your essay? Yeah, and, and it's sort of so. um, helping, coaching people to do that. I mean, I'm sure there are similar writing coach programs yep. to what I did um, to be able to help students embrace and, and really articulate that fullness of themselves. Yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that I, I have the, the good fortune in, of working in four high schools uh, in the state of Massachusetts over my career, and I, I, my sense is that um, school counselors 
English teachers or just you know advisors in the school do a pretty good job of supporting students with that. I think the worry for me, and I think this was part of your question, is the concern around students being forced to talk about um, their, you know, race uh, because otherwise they wouldn't know that's who's writing this essay. Um, that's a challenge I think that also needs to be thought about because some students may want to show up different uh, in their essay, and so it's just you know the landscape. The, the challenge is complicated, uh, but I think in general. Uh, to your initial question, I think we do a good job mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in? I just want to make sure, and I've been pushing lots of young people. They write, and I. What one thing I'm asking them to, to do this summer is to share their essays with their friends. Mm -hmm. Let them critique it. Let them give ideas. And one thing is that you know a lot of things that I'm finding a lot of students like to study alone is that you're going to have to work together. I remember taking my graduate statistics class. That was the worst class I ever took in my whole life. <laughs> but you know what? If I didn't have those four or five people with me at night telling me how, what mm -hmm. I did wrong on those problems, those are the ones that got me through. And so we got to start looking at ways to get groupthink, all right? Mm -hmm. How we work together to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not just one person sitting there banging your head out. You got to look at your students and and uh, other students as allies in the, in the process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to turn it over now to the audience for anyone who has questions. I understand um, well, there is a microphone there, and I understand we have uh, someone already wanting to ask their question. Hello. Hi. So I'm holding her hand because I think intergenerationally, this is what we need to do. Right? <laughs> My name is Sharon Henson. I'm an educator of over 40 years, the founder and executive director of Black Teachers Matter. My father was one of the architects um, of Operation Exodus along with Ruth Batson and Ellen Jackson that became METCO. And he always had the uh, opinion that METCO was supposed to be a short-term solution so that while we built our own schools. Howard University has more graduates and more students than all of the Ivy League schools combined. It's two questions. First off, I'm a college professor. I don't think college is for everybody. I don't. Are you going to put emphasis on trades and vocational schools because you can easily earn a great living and there was a whole generation that bought houses and, and uh, supported their families and didn't incur debt, which you cannot get rid of, despite Biden's plan. That's the first thing. Reports also show that if a student sees a black teacher by the third grade, they're 40% more likely to graduate and go to college. So what are we doing to support the technical vocational schools and to support black teachers because the Boston Public Schools, which is the only school committee mm -hmm. that is not elected, has never reached Judge Garrity's ruling of 25% black teachers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. Chancellor Chen? Uh, two I'll, questions. I'll start two on the, questions. On the two questions. Yeah, I'll start on the first one, which is, yes, I agree. Go uh, college is not the route for everyone. And there are some really great opportunities in the trades for folks that uh, that's a better fit for them. What I wanted to say, though, is you should not not apply to college because you think it's not uh, you're not going to be successful, okay? So don't close that door because someone else tells you it's not for you. You can choose a different path if that's the right one for you. And then the other thing I want to make sure is there's a lot of great programs that are being built up right now on apprenticeships and things that are for right out of high school. I think those are great for a lot of students. Don't think that that is necessarily the end. You, do, you want to get that great entry-level job, but you don't want to be in that entry-level job 20 years from now. So as you get into that job and you continue to think about how do I get my next knowledge, how do I get my next certificate, how to keep moving upwards because you should not settle for being in that entry-level job for your entire career. Mm. And I know you want to... Yeah. And never Thank settle you. in general either. <laughs> So um, I, I will just start by saying that a very good friend and colleague uh, of, of mine uh, from Lynn talks about this idea of co-authorship uh, in the K-12 space, meaning uh, we are co-authoring the path forward with students. They're in the driver's seat. We're just there to support and guide and help them realize their dreams. That might be college. 
that might be, you know, work right after learning a trade. Uh, and so that's the sort of orientation that I approach my work with. Uh, relative to your um, very astute observation around uh, vocational education, uh, there's not a vocational school in the state of Massachusetts that doesn't have a wait list. They all do. Uh, they're in high, high demand right now for all the right reasons. Someone once told me, well, I have to fact check this, that the fastest way to become a millionaire is through plumbing, actually, in this, and this is probably true. I, you know, I, well, someone please fact check that. But, um, and so from the state standpoint, few things have, have happened. Uh, one, because there's so much demand and not enough seats in vocational schools, they've started a program called uh, After Dark. I actually had this in Lynn when I was superintendent there, and it allowed students who have, who are attending the comprehensive high school to have a slightly different schedule that allowed them to uh, be bussed over to the vocational school. They call it After Dark, it's supposed to be at night, but it's really late afternoon uh, to, learn, uh, to learn a trade. Uh, that is opening up seats across the state for students who are interested in, in proceeding that way. The other thing that I would say is um, the state is also pushing innovation career pathways, which provide a vocational school light experience for students who are in traditional high schools. Um, they have work-based learning experiences. Typically, there's an early college aspect to that where they're learning, um, you know, taking a college class that's related to the early the, the pathway that they're in, um, and then their specific high school coursework, usually it leads to an industry recognized credential, similar to what uh, students are, are engaging in in a vocational school. And so uh, your, your point is spot on, there's, there's a lot of interest and support for that. The last thing that I would say really quickly is, uh, if you give me this mic, I will, I, I, I am dangerous. Uh, the last thing that I would say is, um, the state has dedicates about $24 million to a capital skills grant to help schools that are and districts that are interested in building out the structure and materials and equipment in their schools to help do more vocational-like training. Uh, that, that program has been in place for a number of years. So, Awesome. What's that? Yeah. We, okay, I wanna, uh, this is great, and we will have time afterwards, I hope, to continue that discussion. It's a very important one. We do have a question from uh, a young person here. Go right ahead. We have a, a couple minutes here left. Mm -hmm. so. Hello, my name is Jarielli Rivera. I'm 16 years old and I come from Boston Arts Academy, um, representing from Greatest Mind. And my question is, um, as I'm approaching the college administration process, should I be thinking differently also because I am Latina? Great question. She hears me all day, so go for it. <laughs> thinking, uh, thinking differently, I think you should be thinking like uh, everybody here in terms of what is it and exploring what is it I want to do, right? What is it? And you probably don't necessarily know at this point. You probably shouldn't know at this point. So I would encourage you, as Chip said, try lots of things, right? Go to college. Uh, if that's the right path, go to college. When you're in college, try lots of uh, programs, clubs, uh, explore, because that's the beauty of it. You get a chance to explore and go, eh, that was okay, and wow, that's really exciting. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that we focus on at UMass Lowell is making sure every student has at least one paid internship to explore what's a good career path, because I myself had one, and I realized I don't like hospitals, but I love testing things. So I en ended up as a mechanical engineer. Explore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both so much. So we will have time. Um, we have one more question, I, I believe. If you can make it expeditious, please. I will. <laughs> I'm Carol Copeland Thomas. I am a longtime diversity professional and also the interim chief diversity officer at Curry College, which has a race neutral program. And also their incoming first year students, highest number of black and brown students ever in the history of the school with over 40% of the students um, representing the class of 2027. My question is about legacy. What is being said about legacy on higher education, college, university, um, uh, campground, um, campuses, and what can be done about that. I understand that Wellesley is now disbanding their legacy program. Question. Um, so very briefly, I'm not an expert in that area. Obviously, I know that there are some universities, MIT, I believe, has not had a legacy program for some time. Harvard has a legacy program, and I know that a lot of the ones that do 
are looking at that and because we the logical step from a, this affirmative action decision is also looking at programs like that that give a preference uh, in a way that doesn't address uh, the other criteria that universities look at. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And there may be someone in the room who can talk more about that afterward uh, as well. Uh, we do have one more question. <laughs> Um, hello, ahead. my name is Kingston Mills from Boston. And Hi. the question was, why did student loan forgiveness and um, affirmative action get struck down or banned? Mm. <laughs> Wait, how much time do we have? <laughs> right on, Kingston. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone yeah. yeah. <laughs> Supreme Court. Yeah, it is, it, is a, it is a very good question, and it does speak to right? All the things that lead to who ends up on the Supreme Court. And, and it happens along, right? There's a long path. So one thing I would say is make sure you vote, right? And, and pay attention to things that are happening around you because if you're not paying attention, things that you don't want to happen can yeah. sneak uh, into our world today. Yes, and happen very, very and, quickly. And, and it was your generation the Black Lives Matter, the young people, your friends, all of you hit the streets, all the college yes. students. You showed us again how to go out there again and mm -hmm. show what, what our America's about. So continue that, continue the work that you guys mm -hmm. do. You guys are doing it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I wanna give a big thanks to all of our panelists here as we transition uh, to the next part of our discussion this evening. Now, it is likely that the next battleground for affirmative action will be the workplace. And if so, how can we as a community help workers and companies be prepared for that? Let's take a look at the coming challenges. In the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd in 2020, companies pledged to diversify their places of work. However, the forces behind the recent Supreme Court decision now claim they will focus on affirmative action in workforce hiring. Already, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion roles are diminishing, with over 300 DEI professionals leaving companies due to layoffs, which began in 2021, according to Revelio Labs' 2023 report on the state of DEI. If there's no one steering the diversity ship, and if any rollback of affirmative action occurs in this area, many multicultural candidates might be left without a way to get on board. I think people who are making this decision to diminish DNI are making a huge financial mistake at their own peril. It's either embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion, or really lose the market. Colette Phillips, CEO of Boston Impact Initiative, sees a direct correlation between diversity on college campuses with internships and training opportunities to diversity at work. This whole decision that was made about affirmative action, I think is a false narrative because people are making assumption that institutions are basically putting unqualified candidates into spaces that belong to somebody else. You know, you, you don't go to an elite institution uh, and graduate four years later with a degree by being a slacker. Businesses need to keep thinking strategically about maintaining diversity on all levels, Phillips adds, especially in a presumed colorblind society. I wish that we could follow Dr. King's um, wise advice that we judge people on the content of their characters and not on their skin color. Unfortunately, if we lived in a colorblind society, we would not have white nationalists, we would not have white supremacists and people who are shouting white power. And we would not have had incidents like Charlottesville and even last year here in Boston, where we had people who were white national nationalists with masks that actually chased a black man. We do not live. I am, I, I am sorry to have to inform you, Justice 
Thomas, we do not live in a colorblind society. According to a 2023 report by the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, Caucasians made up nearly 86% of chief executive positions held nationally. Of that, nearly 30% were held by white women and nearly 6% by black men and women combined. We benefit from diversity. The studies are there. It's about business. It's the bottom line. Your marketplace have changed and you have to change to accommodate your marketplace. Shout out to Colette Phillips. She was there and now she's here. Look at her. <laughs> Well, joining us on stage is Brooke Thompson, who is the president of Associated Industries of Massachusetts, representing more than 3,400 businesses across more than 150 industries. Also with us is Dr. Lee Pelton, who is a CEO and president of the Boston Foundation, one of the nation's leading philanthropic organizations. Before that, he served as president of Emerson College and Willamette University. I got it right that time. I won't, tell you, I won't tell you the tip that he told me, remember, it is not uh, public media friendly. But, uh, but also with us is Yvonne Espinosa Madrigal, who is the executive director of Lawyers for Civil Rights, the largest and oldest organization in New England working on legal and policy issues impacting racial justice, immigration, public health, education, and entrepreneurship. Thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> So, Brooke, I'm going to start with you um, since your, your work covers so many businesses and so many industries. Is this conversation coming up already? It is. And first, I want to say thank you so much for having us here tonight and for engaging in this discussion. Um, I, I know Colette and I talked about this. The time is now for us to be having this conversation, and it does involve the business community. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, uh, businesses are already talking about it and associations like AIM are trying to, again, continue to keep a dialogue going because it is important. And because the, the first panel was great and we had conversations about the impact with respect to colleges and universities, but the fact is that businesses need to be at the forefront, and many are in this state, mm -hmm. focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and making sure that they are representing in their workforce the people in society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Yvonne, I mean, or the affirmative action ruling was about education, but of course, as we just mentioned, the fear is that it's coming for employment next. What are some of the things that, are, that were in the ruling that could spell implications for that to actually happen? Well, even before the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action, we have had a significant amount of, of really toxic rhetoric around diversity, equity, and inclusion. The implosion of Silicon Valley Bank, for example, was blamed on having uh, a couple of people of color on its board of directors, something that is completely a non-issue. Mm -hmm. But yet, just the fact that a company is moving in this direction poses such a threat that it must be stopped and it has to be attacked. And so even before the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action, we've seen this toxic narrative about how diversity is harmful. And as uh, my friend Colette Phillips was articulating before, the data shows otherwise. And so what we now see is that right-wing people are clinging on to any word mm. in the Supreme Court decision to try to engage in bogus and frivolous reviews of diversity policies that should remain in place and that have nothing to do with what the Supreme Court said. And so we need to be very careful here because nuance is important. The Supreme Court's decision is about higher education and admissions. And even then, it didn't say that race is outlawed. It said it needed to be more narrowly tailored. And so we need to be nuanced because what's at stake is the lived experience and also the business transactions that this panel is talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing policies that are limiting uh, the, impl Im the implementation of DEI and DEIA training right, in workplaces. Uh, and to that point, Dr. Pelton, do you think that we could begin to see some companies preemptively 
uh, acting in this way, maybe cutting their DEIA budgets um, or, or doing away with certain programs? Well, uh, first of all, let me, the, the young man who asked about why this uh, is occurring now, you, you should know we're in a, this is a backlash. That's all it is. It's a backlash. We've been here before, uh, and we'll probably be here again. Uh, and the important thing for us to do is to not retreat, uh, but to be aggressive and to, be, and to reaffirm and recommit ourselves, whether it's in colleges and universities or it's in our businesses, to reaffirm our commitment to diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and equity and belonging. So... So I need to say that. I won't get into a, a, a conversation about the difference between Title VI and Title VII under the, uh, you know, under the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and how one applies to uh, admissions and, and one applies to uh, employment. Um, but, uh, you know, it's already started. Just this week, uh, 13 uh, uh, attorneys generals uh, in GOP states said they were coming after the, one, the top 100 corporations in this country around their DEI programs yeah. and their affirmative action programs. So they're, you know, that's, already, that's already started. Mm -hmm. But I, but I, I want to go back to Yvonne's point, which is uh, this decision is about admissions, and it's not directly about the workforce and, and employment. But there are those who will uh, cling to that as a way to uh, to bring us back to a place that we used we used to be. Uh, but the first the two things we we shouldn't do we shouldn't panic. Uh, we should have a plan, uh, and we should be forceful in our uh, efforts to combat this. And I think I think that uh, as in as in uh, colleges and universities, as in uh, workplace the emphasis will probably have to shift from hiring to recruitment. That is to say, we will have to you know, cast a really wide net uh, and use that as a way uh, to, to bring about our diversity diversity ends mm -hmm. through, through hiring, but, but through recruitment at the, at the top end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Brooke, to that point, I mean, we were speaking earlier about what having a diverse student body does for a college campus. What does having a diverse workforce do for our economy? It's a great question, and actually, I think it's what makes Massachusetts a leader as far as workforce. You know, um, thanks to initiatives by uh, Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll and their team talking about, you know, Massachusetts does have some negatives. We have some cold weather, right? <laughs> um, we have some expensive housing, but what are our assets? And our assets are really our diversity. And that plays directly into the workforce. And at a time like this, post-COVID, when people can almost live anywhere and work anywhere, we have to be on the cutting edge as far as a competitive workforce. And what I would say is doubling down our efforts at the corporate level on DE&I and making sure, to Lee's point, that we are recruiting and uh, providing opportunities for folks who maybe didn't see themselves in a certain sector to realize, wait, this is really for me. And I'll give you a perfect example that we hear all the time at AIM. Um, one of our historic and really um, impactful sectors here in Massachusetts is financial services. Um, I think there's some misunderstanding that financial services is something New York, New York City does, right? If you look at the history, Massachusetts is where it began. And I also think, though, there is some demystification we need to do around what that industry is and who should be looking at it as something that may be for them. And um, I know I'm guilty of this. I think we all are. And I think part of what the first panel talked about is important, right? Getting in and having businesses have that direct interaction with students K through 12. Because some folks, again, maybe college is not the right track for you. Having those interactions at our community colleges, having those interactions at our colleges and universities, let students and young people see, hey, maybe this is for me. And that's where I think, again, we can start that recruiting piece at an early age into our workforce to make us a leader 
as opposed to Texas and Florida and all these other states when it comes to having the greatest minds and the most diverse perspectives at the table in these companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yvonne, is it possible that companies uh, could begin to set certain metrics for saying, okay, we want to um, diversify uh, here at GBH, this is a prime example, we want to diverse our newsroom and get to this uh, point by this year, right? And say, uh, we want to be more reflective of the city of Boston, et cetera, et cetera. Could that be a way to sort of safeguard um, and maybe not make it about affirmative action, but make it about this is what we're trying to do, this is what we're trying to achieve when we look at um, our, our employee makeup? I think there are multiple options that exist and, uh, and some may be more practical and easy to implement than others, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, this is, as, as the previous panelists and, and my distinguished panelists are saying, this is the time to continue to really double down, to make sure that you are not stepping away from the diversity programs that have been a key part of your institutional culture. Uh, even if there is a lot of pressure or even the threat of litigation against your company. And, and that's critical because if you start watering down your diversity programs or you start eliminating them altogether because cautious lawyers are telling you that this is the safe thing to do, mm -hmm. uh, then you risk the other side of the pendulum, which is being sued for creating a hostile work environment because you're getting rid of policies that benefit the employees of color. And so companies will have to thread this needle, will have to make sure that they continue diversity initiatives that benefit the, the workforce and that they've uh, uh, held on to for a long time and should continue to, to implement. And they also need to think through carefully how they continue to attract talent and to create initiatives and programs that address the needs that you see on the ground. And so perhaps uh, instead of focusing squarely on race, wh which employment practices should never be focused just on race. They should be focused on who's qualified for the job and taking a look at, at a multitude of factors. It's, it's not just about race. That's not the way hiring happens at any place. That's not the way colleges look at applicants. We heard the chancellor. It's a holistic process, right? And so businesses should stick to a holistic review of who they want, what is the talent that they need, and they should also be thinking about programs that, frankly, uh, mimic what universities are doing in some ways. Universities that have invested heavily in first-generation programming to attract non-traditional students, students who wouldn't have been there before. Companies should be doing the same. How do we attract people into businesses, as we were just talking about financial services, where they didn't necessarily see themselves before? And so that's the opportunity here. It's a time to really double down, not divest. Mm -hmm. and, and Brooke, give us an idea of where we're seeing sort of the most need to diversify. Where, what are the industries uh, that are really lacking in that area right now? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think there's work that can be done everywhere, right? So let's level set that. Um, I do think, and I, I, huge kudos to the financial services industry because they are out in front on this. They recognize that um, they want to work collaboratively, right, with organizations like AIM, with nonprofit partners, with college students, with high school students to demystify some of these things. But again, I, I say, and I know the first panel was really great about saying, particularly to the students in this room, right, sit back and think about what you want to do. If college is for you, great. If not, great. But I, I'm going to challenge you and everybody who's watching at home to say, particularly, what do I need to know about all of the different types of opportunities that are out there, right? And, and I'm going to say it's a two-way street. I want you all to ask questions. I want you to find somebody in your life who, you know, ask them, what do you do? How did you get into that? What, do you like what you do? How did that even come up? And then I'm going to challenge, as we have at AIM, our business partners to say, 
please go out, find these students at the high school level, at the college level, and try to expand opportunities, whether that's through internships or, you know, again, shadowing for a day, so that you can get a sense and demystify what is really available out there. And then I'm gonna make a little plug that the more the business community can partner with nonprofits and make these internships paid internships, mm. the better chance we are gonna get that diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Pelton, we've mentioned um, that we have a, you know, a number of companies represented here in programs uh, that are really instrumental in trying to diversify our workforce, including Get Connected, the Partnership, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, et cetera. What, are they, I mean, are they doing enough? What more can be done? And, and how can we as a community rally around to support them and get those yes. services to the people who need them? Well, first of all, so first of all, you know, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination on race, uh, based on race, color, sex, and uh, religion uh, in hiring practices. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about uh, recruitment. So companies can still establish recruitment goals, but they can't establish hiring quotas. So that's one thing that we should know. The other thing that the, prop, the, the issue with this ruling is that it's going to threaten uh, the pipeline of leadership mm. uh, in all walks of life. That's its real threat. And so I would encourage companies uh, to begin to develop pipeline leadership programs, be proactive in that particular way. Uh, I often say that uh, if you want to change society, you change the, you, you change, uh, the folks who are in power rather than trying to change the minds of those who are in power. And that's mm -hmm. about leadership. And so we need to develop leadership programs. Uh, and I, I could talk all, all day about why that's mm -hmm. important. Um, but it brings to, uh, you know, to, to, to companies uh, a, different kind of, uh, a different kind of leadership for both women and folks of color because of their experiences that, that, they, that they have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would urge us to move in that direction for sure. Can I add one thing to what Lee said? Oh, right. You gotta see it to be it, right? And so that's again, to your point, we need those people in leadership positions. Um, I can say that as the first female leader of Associated Industries of Massachusetts in our 108 year history, right? I hope folks see, again, that if, if you're putting it out there and you're putting uh, women and people of color in leadership positions, then that does have a real effect for the generation that's coming up saying, I can do that too, or that might be for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, along that, it is so important for, for us, instead of being in the mindset of, okay, what do we have to get rid of? Because we have to be careful, we have to be cautious, to be in the opposite mindset, which is how do we defend what we have mm. in place? Because the inevitability of litigation is something that we will all have to live with. Mm -hmm. that, that is just, and I really love the way that GBH posted earlier about not if, but when. Mm -hmm. Because that is the volatile world we are living in due to the backlash that Dr. Pelton was talking about. And so let's get ready, but let's get ready not by sacrificing our values and the diversity programs and initiatives that we care about. Let's get ready by going into defense mode, by making sure that we can articulate how we want to defend the programs that currently exist and create new ones along the lines of what we're talking about, not just in universities, but in the workplace. That's the mindset we need to be in, in the creative mindset of being able to defend the values we hold dear. And that also means empowering ourselves, right? Like all of us in this room have academic affiliations or employment affiliations. It is critical for us to use our voice to not let the conversation end here. Call your alma mater and say that you want them to get rid of legacy admissions. Mm -hmm. Call your employer and say that they need to invest more in creating diversity initiatives. That's the mindset we need to be in right now. 
Mm -hmm. And also, Yvonne, I, I want to ask you too, I mean, on the individual level, right? Um, because being in workplaces, especially as a, a, mem a member of a marginalized group, is, it can be difficult, right? And there are all these sorts of things that happen to you on a daily basis sometimes. You're like, what is, like, you know, is this, is it in my head or is it something that's really playing out? Um, is there something to be said there when we when we were thinking about this landscape about what people should be looking out for? Maybe if they suspect that their company is trying uh, to curtail some of these policies and some of these um, the implementation of some of these programs. I think that is so incredibly important. Like we are getting word of of what I consider to be extremely alarming and problematic reviews of diversity policies at the municipal level mm -hmm. in various companies all over the place. And, and this is coming from the friendly quarter. This is coming from players who you would typically think would be on our side. And so now imagine what our enemies are thinking about. <laughs> and, so, and so that's really alarming to me. And, and we need to make sure that we stand up to it and Dr. Pelton uh, alluded to this, the 13 attorney generals that are coming after the Fortune 100 companies. Well, today, 21 good attorney generals issued a competing letter explaining why the Supreme Court's ruling does not apply in the workplace. And so that's exactly what we need to be doing, not caving, but actually coming up with the arguments to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely, if we are seeing weakness and caution, we should be speaking out loud and clear about the preservation of the programs that we hold dear and the elimination of preferences that we have all lived with for far mm -hmm. too long that only benefit elite white interests. It is time to eliminate them fully, which is why Lawyers for Civil Rights brought its complaint against Harvard to eliminate donor and legacy preferences. Mm -hmm. But we can't end there. It is critical for all of us to examine how we are showing up in the racial justice space, how we are creating room for more <laughs> diversity, for more women, for more people at the intersections of life experiences that we care about, because we need to make room for all of the greatest minds that are in this audience mm -hmm. and for all the viewers watching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a real opportunity. Um, I, I, it'll be funny for anybody watching me because I'm usually not the optimist in the room, but um, <laughs> I think it's a real opportunity for, for businesses, right, to do what they've really been thoughtfully doing for a while now, which is looking at their core values, right? And we all know in this digital world, right, that the stakes are pretty high um, for businesses with respect to how people will... Um, for lack of a better term, vote with their wallets, right, on issues. But I think I will give uh, some optimism to this conversation. I think the majority, particularly in Massachusetts of our businesses, are really focused on what are our core values, right? We might deliver a product, we might deliver a service, but we have to be more than that, particularly if we're going to be the employer of choice. And again, I go back to the competitive environment in which we live um, from a business perspective, but also from a workforce perspective, right? You have the choice. You are what businesses want. They want you in the door. And so you can really add value and speak through your core values about how you want your employer to treat you, to embrace you, and to try to help you grow and succeed. And so again, I, I look at this as a real opportunity for Massachusetts to stand out, and again, for all of our employers to be those employers of choice. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I want to turn it now, Dr. Pelton. We'll make sure you get the, the first answer to the first question we have uh, from Pratt Wiley of the partnership. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you for, for your comments because one of the things that we are hearing certainly from a lot of the corporate leaders that we work with is that values drive value. All right. But the other piece that we're hearing often is that pipelines without pumps are just holes in the ground. All right. And so I'm looking at, at uh, Lee Pelton in particular um, <laughs> as a model, all right, as someone who uh, within an organization can 
uh, more than just provide a face and a vision uh, for leadership, but also provide inspiration for those who are working within the organization and those without. And uh, that, I think, is a piece of the conversation that is missing. Yeah. How does this decision uh, impact not just the students that are here today who are going to be entering the workplace, but those who are going to be making transitions, uh, advancing in their careers, and the, uh, the new obstacles that they are going to face. So that's, that's yeah. part A of the question okay. for, for Lee <laughs> and then for Yvonne. The, the, the reaction that I have of that we should be on defense right now and that, that we should build a coalition uh, to defend, uh, I think is accurate but incomplete. I think we should also be asking, what can we do to be on offense? And you start to talk about that, and I wonder if you can just provide a little bit more of what you all are doing to help pave the way, pay, uh, pave the way for, for offense in terms of advancing our values. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let, let me answer your, I'm going to answer your question the way I was going to, uh, with the reference that I was going to talk about. You know, my fear is that uh, that acronym DEI, uh, has become what I call a kind of kumbaya happy meal, mm -hmm. and that it's lost its uh, it's lost its uh, uh, significance and meaning. Uh, and uh, so I I do believe that if if uh, corporations and businesses are going to uh, recommit themselves to this issue, they need to recommit themselves to what that those those three. Uh, that acronym means. I think uh, part of, uh, I think all of us like, or at least some of us like to think about belonging as opposed to inclusion. And so I think part of the effort uh, among corporations will be, uh, uh, will be, you know, digging in around belonging. Because uh, part, of, part of what we want to do is when folks get there, we want to keep them there, uh, and uh, that in turn provides some leadership opportunities uh, for them. So that I would say that uh, that we not only should be uh, looking at recruitment, uh, but also looking at uh, belonging and the internal environment to make sure that that environment is actually nurturing uh, for the folks who are there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Quickly on the offense point, I think many of the themes that have come up tonight from creating more room in vocational schools for our students, from making sure that we're paying attention to teacher diversity, to eliminating legacy and donor admissions like the complaint that we filed on the heels of the Supreme Court case of lawyers for civil rights, that is the offensive strategy. And there are creative interventions that workplaces, employers, nonprofits, organizations can also be implementing. And I think that's exactly what we need to do now, is be more creative and be more collaborative across silos so that we can all engage in this struggle together and build it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Wow, that was a perfect seg to my question. It's as if we planned it. Uh, my name's Leverett Wing. I am the executive director of a uh, nonprofit called the Commonwealth Seminar. Our mission is, uh, for the last 20 years, has been to open the doors of government to everyone. And so we work with diverse communities to try to educate, train, and make more comfortable uh, diverse communities to access and influence decision makers at all levels of government. So my focus has always been the public sector. And it's wonderful to see um, so many sectors uh, represent the educational sector, the state, mm -hmm. philanthropic, nonprofit businesses. Mm -hmm. But I think we all realize all of these sectors can't do it alone. You know, the, the philanthropic sector can't do it alone, business sector can't do it alone. So it's kind of build on exactly what you said. What can we do to work together? What type of allyships can we build? I, 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 I think you mentioned a little bit earlier the business sector and the, um, and the, uh, the educational sector mm -hmm. maybe aligning to create more paid internships. Mm -hmm. um, That's what, great. That's great. Yeah, what, so I mean, what other perfect. examples, mm -hmm. firm examples, can you, can you, can you maybe mention that, that, that we can all think about and move forward with? No, I think that's great. Thank you for your question and thank you for what you do. I think also, and because I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of a plug, getting involved again in understanding and being engaged in government at the local, at the state and the federal level is very important as well. 
Um, uh, no surprise for anybody who knows me, I um, am on the public policy side of things, and I can't tell you um, how disappointed I get that I don't see more diverse faces going into taking those political internships or working at the state house or getting involved in government because it translates into everything that you would do with a future career and it makes sure that you are engaged and active and talking. So I would say that's the other thing we can do. Uh, you know, we, we do need to work across silos though, right? I think there is a role for the, the private sector, for the nonprofit sector, and for from a public policy perspective. And I think that's why it was great to have Secretary Tutwiler here today, right? Because it's going to take everybody working working together, whether it's resources, whether it's initiatives, right? I always say in my work, I love carrots instead of sticks, but we got to have both, right? We got to have a good mix. I think we got maybe some sticks here and maybe I'm on the carrot side, but you got to have both, right? Um, but you have to have a willingness, really, again, going back to core values. I certainly think we have a governor for whom this is a core value, right? We have an attorney general for whom this is a core value, and we have thousands of business leaders for whom this is a core value. And so working together and continuing to talk about it, right? We, this doesn't mean we have this conversation and we're done, but we continue to have conversations like this that bring those diverse perspectives together to find solutions. Well, you know, this, uh, are you good? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Am I good? Yeah. Yeah. This is about leadership again. You know, we all understand that uh, there's, there's no, you know, there's no sector that can do this or any big issue alone. We have to do it together. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's not rocket science, uh, but we just need, we need to work across disciplines. At the Boston Foundation, we put together a remarkable partnership of leading CEOs of banks, uh, funders, uh, members from uh, the mayor's uh, cabinet, folks from government, uh, and 36 people with the objective of closing the racial wealth gap uh, in, this, in the greater Boston and in the Commonwealth. Uh, and, and you know, that, but that just requires, that requires somebody sitting down and saying, you know, we gotta get everybody together. It is not rocket science, but we gotta stop talking about it uh, and those of us who are in leadership positions have to start doing it. And, and, and what, we've, what you're just talking about is in short supply, uh, not only here, uh, but across the nation. Okay, I believe we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, my name is Grace B. Claire. I live in Cambridge, and I am currently a rising senior at Concord Academy. Um, I, I just had a question. Um, after reading some of the policies from the Office of Federal Contract compliances programs, um, how the recent SCOTUS ruling will affect um, companies and organizations' um, affirmative action, like, or, sorry, companies and organizations' current affirmative action plans right now. Um, I just wanted to get that insight mm -hmm. as someone who's not in the workforce currently. I would say that there is no applicability, that what we are seeing is a Supreme Court decision that is extremely uh, zeroed in in the higher education space and that as we think through the private sector, municipalities, or public contracting, that those programs are completely safe. Uh, but to also be clear, there are already challenges to some of those programs even here in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the next things that we're going to do at Lawyers for Civil Rights is actually uh, join in the defense of one of the states uh, small business programs that was established during the pandemic to help a lot of businesses of color, and that program has, has come under challenge. And so what we're seeing is that even, even though uh, there shouldn't be uh, an impact, people are trying to make a case out of it. And so it's going to require, uh, uh, going back to the analogy, and I appreciate that the carrots and sticks, <laughs> to make sure that we, we create the, the ecosystem that we want to see. So, um, so the answer to your question is, in my view, there is no impact, uh, but it's an issue that's gonna be fought out in court and that we will have to see how the dust settles as many of these things proceed in court because the Supreme Court decision uh, leaves more questions than answers in the current landscape. 
So uh, very quickly before we wrap here, I'm going to invite each of our panelists just to give your, your final thoughts uh, that you want to leave the audience with today. Well, thank you, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel. I, again. I'm raising your hand here, and I think children are very important. Oh, yeah. What we should do is not only blah, blah, blah. Kids, you raise them with candles. Oh, yeah, there's a microphone here. Yeah. I know, but somebody is raising their hand. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Okay, does someone have another question they would like to ask? Don't be shy. Any questions from the students? That's right. Okay, I think we, I, we have to, we have, um, we're, on a t we're on a clock. This is the only <laughs> problem here. Um, but we can certainly continue the discussion afterwards. Go right ahead. Yeah, please. no, and I'll be quick. Um, uh, that's a great point. Let's keep talking. Again, I'll go back to that. And then again, um, continue um, to really work within wherever you are. If you're a student, right? If you're a, a business leader, if you're on the public um, side, continue to double down on your core beliefs, your core uh, value system, and really do um, what is necessary to show that you are the employer of choice. And I, again, I applaud most of our businesses here in the state who are doing just that. You know, I, I must quote this uh, every day. Uh, James Baldwin said that not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be, uh, and so we need truth tellers uh, in this world. Uh, we, we really do. The other thing we have to understand is that we didn't, th we didn't get here by accident. We didn't get here by accident. Uh, what we're talking about now is built into the very fabric and structure of uh, America. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that it is structural, it's systems, and so we have an opportunity to change the structure and to change the systems. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Follow the community's lead. The community has the uh, ideas and, uh, and the solutions that are available for the issues and problems that we're seeing. And so community inclusion and having a community-driven approach is going to be critical to hear the voices and perspectives represented by the youth to hear the voices and perspective of other affected communities, I think it's gonna be critical. Well, we wanna give our utmost gratitude to our amazing guest tonight, also to all of you in the audience for coming out, thank you. And our appreciation to our partners. Uh, we thank you for joining us here and at home. We will be following up with links to resources and information to provide some early guidance to students and institutions, employees and companies. And we wish you all a great evening, thank you. And also for everyone is who is here, uh, we, we do have a space and time for you all to continue the discussion. We have a reception in our atrium, uh, so please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.